Hello and welcome back to CS420, a course on game hacking. In this lecture, we'll be finishing off data types and covering more advanced game hacking techniques. Specifically, we'll learn how to hack numbers that we can't see, like the XYZ coordinates of a player or a health bar with no shown numbers. This is known as an unknown value scan. So data types are just ways that information can be stored on a computer. We've already learned quite a few so far. We understand how to store strings in both ASCII and Unicode. And we also learned how to represent integers and learned that we can represent larger ones by using more bytes. However, there's a few things that we haven't learned. We haven't learned how to store negative numbers and we haven't learned how to store fractional numbers. That is numbers with a decimal point. So putting what we've learned in chart form, here are the data types that we've learned so far. We learned that we can group numbers into one, two, four, or eight bytes. And the more bytes we use, the larger the maximum. And we learned that there are names for these groupings. One byte is just known as a byte, easy enough. Two bytes can be known as a short. We will ignore this word unsigned for now. We'll get to this later. Four bytes is an integer and eight bytes is a long. Near the bottom of the chart, we have string, which we learned could be variable in length. And I never touched on this, but an individual character of a string can be referred to as a char or character. And each character takes up one byte if we're dealing with ASCII. Now let's learn some new data types. In video games, there are many cases where we need to represent a value as true or false. A value that can be true or false is known as a Boolean. Here's some examples that you're familiar with. In a video game, there might be a Boolean called is alive that tracks whether or not an enemy is alive. If it's true, the enemy is alive. If it's false, the enemy is dead. Here's another example. If is on is true, then this torch is on. And if is on is false, then this torch is off. Now, when we actually go to store the value in memory, we use one to represent true and zero to represent false. Very straightforward. Now, you might think that it works like this. A reasonable person might assume that a single bit of information is all you need for a Boolean. Zero is false, one is true. Unfortunately, this is wrong. In reality, it works like this. An entire byte is used and some memory gets wasted. Remember before when we learned that bits are grouped by eight? Well, a side effect of computers using these groupings is that we're not allowed to have a data type smaller than that. This means that we still use a one or zero in the first position to represent true and false, but we also have another seven bits that are just wasted. There are a few exceptions to this that I want to briefly mention. Technically, it's possible to use one bit of information, but the programmer seriously has to go out of their way to do this. This technique is referred to as a bit field or bit flag, and it's really rare in practice, but I've seen it in a few games. Uh, Dark Souls 3, for example, uses bit flags, but I'm not gonna cover them now. Uh, scanning for a single bit is a fairly advanced hacking technique, so I'm not gonna cover it here, uh, but scanning for this sort of structure is a lot easier because you just scan for a byte. It's also worth mentioning that some programming languages waste even more space. Games written in C or C++ generally use one byte. However, games written in C Sharp use four bytes and games written in Java use eight. Now let's update our mental model. It's starting to get a little messy, but we're almost done updating this. We see now that Booleans are represented as a single byte, which has a value of either one or zero. Here at address 389, we have one stored, which is true. And over here, we have zero stored, which is false. Now note that this is a hex number instead of binary and that two hex digits are again, just one byte. Moving on, putting this into our chart, I've added one more row at the bottom for Booleans. They take one byte and they can have a value of zero or one. Now it's important to note that while zero is false, anything else is true. So if you, because it's one byte of information, you can put another number there. You could put 155 in a Boolean and that would still just be true. Anything that's not zero is true. Now let's learn how negative numbers are stored. We've been learning about positive numbers only so far and that's what the word unsigned means. It means there is no negative sign. 
The word signed means there can potentially be a negative sign. Let's learn how this works. If a number is signed, the first bit indicates that the number can be positive or negative. The rest of the number comes from the remaining bits. Now, because one bit is being used for the sign, this means that the number can't be as big as an unsigned number. I'll show some examples of this later. I just want to briefly mention that I glossed over some details here. There's a beautiful system that modern computers use for handling negative numbers called Two's Complement, but I'm not going to get into it. As a game hacker, you don't need to know how this system works. However, for those who are interested in having a deeper understanding of this material, I encourage you to watch videos or read up on Two's Complement. This system could easily be its own 15 minute lecture, which is why I'm not going deeper into it. Now let's add the signed version of integers to our chart. So now we have signed and unsigned integers that use one, two, four, or eight bytes. And see here, we've dropped the unsigned from these. Uh, bytes are slightly different. Uh, a byte is already unsigned by definition. So that the naming's a little different on this and we call a signed byte signed, whereas everything else uses the opposite convention, right? Short is default signed and then we say unsigned otherwise byte is kind of flipped here so it's important to point some things out a signed byte goes as low as negative 128 and as high as 127 we can see that the range is just shifted off the positive number right this goes from 0 to 255 negative to 128 to 127 there both of these have 225 possible numbers it's just that for the signed version, some of these numbers are negative. So now that we know almost all the data types, there are just a few left to learn. We still need to cover fractional numbers, which are numbers that have a decimal point. In computer science, these are known as floating point numbers. There are two main data types for doing this. The first is a float, and the other is known as a double. These two data types are almost identical, but they have slight differences that we'll talk about later. For now, let's just focus on learning what a float is. A float needs to be able to handle a lot of situations. This is because computers have important real world uses. We need to be able to use computers for math and science. If a chemist is weighing out trace amounts of chemicals, that might be a number like 0. 0.000002 grams. If a mathematician is analyzing the limit of a function, it might go to infinity, and we wouldn't want to lie to the mathematician and just give them a really big number. We would actually want to let them know that it's infinity. However, we don't have infinite space. In fact, a float takes up four bytes of information. And because of these requirements, floats are incredibly complicated in how they are stored. Again, this is one of those things where we don't really need to know the details. Now there's one more data type, and that's a double. And it works exactly like a float, but we have more bytes to work with. Doubles rarely come up in video games because video games don't really need high precision math. Doubles come up more frequently in scientific computing. One final thing to note, to avoid confusion, sometimes people put an F after numbers that are supposed to be floats, and doubles won't have this F. Now, people don't always do this, but you'll see it quite often in languages like C, C++, and C Sharp. So now we have the last two data types added to our chart. You can ignore the minimum and maximum values for these. They're not very useful uh, for everyday practice. And one thing to note is that floats also might be referred to as a single. Okay, finally finished updating our chart. So we have a float here taking up four bytes and we have a double here taking up eight bytes. Very straightforward. Now we're not gonna be really looking at this diagram again for a while, we can bunch it all up and just call it data. And this is likely how we'll refer to what we've learned here in the future. We'll just refer to it as data. Now let's take what we learned about data types and apply it to some real game hacking techniques. So now let's jump into another example with Squally. Uh, some updates, I've removed the minigames tab and have added this hacking tutorials. Minigames were rolled into the game, so now I'm going to kind of put everything that I've been showing here. Uh, these are meant to be used with external tools, as, sh as this uh, description says. This UI is not really complete yet, uh, but this will be in the next release. So we can go into this int32 example. 
And the way this works is that our goal is to kill this enemy. We just pull this lever and they take damage, pretty straightforward. But we realize rather quickly that once they get down to half health, they just heal up. So there's no way to kill them through normal gameplay. So what we can do is go into Squalor, attach it to Squally. And we don't know what value to scan for. It's not like we can go, ah, 100, right? It's a reasonable guess, but it might not be right. So instead what we do is collect values. And what this does is it takes a snapshot of all memory in this game. So we've essentially collected every value in the game. Now what we do is go ahead and pull this lever. And the enemy took eight damage. So we go decreased by eight. And what this does is it scans the values we collected to see which things have decreased by eight since the snapshot was taken. Okay, so far so good. There are 120 results, but we can narrow it down a little further. Decreased by six now. So we go in, six, scan, and there's one result. Very straightforward, and we can change this to zero, and the enemy died. Let's jump into another example, this time scanning for floats. We'll be using Cheat Engine this time instead of Squalor, just to make sure that I cover all my bases here. And for this example, we're going to be trying to get through this wall and to that door. So what we want to do is go into Float, and we're going to be writing a teleportation hack, right? We need to change our X position. So what we want to do is do an unknown initial value scan. This is similar to the collect values from earlier. And it's going to work very similar. As we move to the right, the value increases. But we don't know by how much. We just know that it has increased. So we hit increased. And we just keep doing this. And it takes a lot longer than the previous method because the other one we knew exactly by how much. This time it's giving us everything that increases or decreases. And you can also set up hotkeys to make this easier, but I just want people to be able to follow along, so I'm not using hotkeys here. And there are, are some other things that make this tricky as well, like this snowman has an X position, and this flying robot has an X position. So if you can try and weave those out, see I moved to the right here, but the snowman didn't move, that's a good, a good way to separate those two when you're scanning, so decreased value. And we're probably not going to narrow it much further than this. So what we can do is kind of gamble. What we do is add all of these to our address list. And we take the first half or quarter or whatever, hit spacebar to freeze it, and it worked. Our position is somewhere in here because when we try to move, it keeps getting uh, frozen back in place. There's a good chance if you do something like this, the program will just crash because you're freezing all of this memory and only one of these is the X position and the rest of it is God knows what else. So we know it's in this highlighted bunch here. So what we can do is unfreeze them and select everything we didn't edit and delete it because we know it's not in those. And we just rinse repeat, take the first you know chunk of addresses here. Okay, it's in this chunk. So unfreeze them and delete whatever's left. And this is just this just shows how complicated uh, scanning can get, kind of at the harder levels. I'm just gonna keep doing this. You know what's going on. Oops, I accidentally lost my selection. Okay, it's in this chunk. Delete what's left. Try these. Cool. So now we've narrowed it down to six here. So I'm just gonna try these one by one or a couple at a time. Not quite, probably this one. Okay, so this is the X position. So we can call it player X, delete everything else. We no longer need these. And now we can just teleport ourselves through the door by changing this to a larger number, say 2800. And now we're over here. Now, one cool thing to note is let me, let me put my position back. Oops, 
Okay, one cool thing to note is that when you find the X position in a game, you can just copy paste it, just control C, control V. And what you can do is because floats are four bytes, you can put plus four in the address of the new one, call it player Y. And there's a very high probability that you also found the Y position. I just uh, killed the player there. And the reason that works is because floats take up four bytes of memory and games will often store coordinates right next to each other because that's how the programmer made the game, right? You put the X and Y coordinates of the player in the same, uh, right? If you were to code up the game, right? You, you'd go uh, back to dot age, right? X, Y, right? When you program the game, you put these next to each other and it'll be that way when the game runs too. And yeah, like I said, floats are four bytes, so the Y position is usually just four bytes away from the X position. So just a cool trick to save you a bunch of time. Now, before I end this video, I want to point out something really important. I've relaunched Squally, and I'm going to jump back into that float tutorial. Reattach Cheat Engine to the new running copy of Squally. And you'll notice that the X and Y cheats from earlier no longer work, right? I'm moving around, but they're stuck at zero. However, if I jump into that example with the int32, right? And I've reattached Squalor to the new version of Squally. This address still works. I can go ahead and change this to zero and the enemy dies, easy peasy. Now this has nothing to do with cheat engine versus Squalor, it would happen in either one but it comes down to something called static and dynamic memory. And we will learn about these later, but for now, just know that sometimes cheats will work again when you relaunch the game and sometimes they won't. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something new. As usual, if you need anything clarified or have any feedback, drop a comment below. Thank you.